Hello, hello. All right, we need to get cranked up here. Everyone can grab a seat. We'll get started. in the home stretch here. Thanks everyone for hanging with us. It's great to see the attendance still really high here in this room. Um, I hope everyone's had a, had a good conference. As I said before, this is my first Visions conference and it's uh, a great uh, honor and privilege for me to see and meet all of you and to hear so many uh, great stories about how the foundation has been helpful uh, in so many ways for your journeys as well as ours. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you've made some new friends and met a lot of new people and met some of the researchers and people that are on the front lines, uh, you know, fighting to end uh, blindness due to retinal disease. Uh, for me, it's really gratifying to just see the whole community together. So uh, thanks to everyone for coming out and contributing. You know, we really are a family, and when we get together in this kind of setting, it, it becomes so true, and we can just feel it in our bones. And I know I feel it. I hope you feel it, too. So now it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Eddie Rusnow, who's uh, on the board of directors of the Foundation Fighting Blindness, who's going to present our volunteer award. So, Eddie, come on up. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, so I have to say that uh, presenting awards at the Visions Conference is a, uh, a good and easy gig. Last night, I had the pleasure of presenting uh, to one of my good friends, Steve Alper, uh, the privilege of presenting the award for uh, the Builders of Sight last night. And of course, I have the privilege of uh, doing more of that today. Uh, these awards are so important to our organization because it shows all the great work our members do around the country at walks, at dinners, other events, and chapters is essential to FFB during its, during, driving its mission. You, our members, are the lifeblood of our organization. So let's get started with the first award, which will be the outstanding chapter of the year. The Outstanding Chapter Award recognizes a sustained level of high achievement of a chapter in year-over-year -year growth, success in fundraising, chapter leadership, communications and outreach, and education. And we're proud to award the 2018 Outstanding Chapter to Denver. So a little bit about the Denver chapter. Uh, the Denver chapter leaders are actively involved in the Denver Vision Walk. The leaders raise close to $57,000, and the leaders also participate in the scramble for sight, and through their efforts, helped raise $103,000. And accepting the award on behalf of the Denver chapter is our national trustee, Sherry Krunenberg. So Sherry, please come up. Sherry Krunenberg, Denver. Okay, on to the next award, which is for the Outstanding Vision Walk. This award recognizes a vision walk that has surpassed budgeted goal, been one of the top dollar walks in the past calendar year in their market category, and has the most sponsors or sponsor dollars, and or had the highest teams and walker uh, registrations. The 2018 Outstanding Vision Walk goes to Colorado. Wow. And uh, just a little side note, this is the third consecutive year that this walk has raised its goal and exceeded that goal. 
So I think that uh, we need to give a big round of applause there to Colorado. And here to accept the award on behalf is Linda Worth. Linda, come on up. So this next award is to um, for outstanding trustee, and I have to say that uh, this one really uh, really hits home. Uh, it's being uh, awarded to somebody that I I met many years ago. I don't remember if it was at uh, Visions Conference or at uh, a Day of Science, but uh, I really hit it off with this person and. Uh, We've been friends ever since. I think we probably know each other now, going on 15, 15 years, I would guess. Um, the na this national trustee is being recognized for his notable contributions, including philanthropy, his volunteerism, his networking, that has led to so much success in his area of the country. And the sustained commitment that he has in his leadership of the foundation's mission during his tenure. The 2018 Outstanding Trustee Award goes again to Colorado and Scott Burt, who is from Denver. Now, be, Scott, before, before you accept this award, just a little bit more background about Scott. Um, Scott has chaired the Scramble for Sight Golf Tournament and the taste of the Rockies since the year 2000. So he's really been at it for a very long time. In 2017, these events together raised a record $103,000. So let's give him a big hand for that. In addition to that, Scott participates in quarterly chapter leadership conference calls and the annual vision walk. The scramble for sight is also a high-tech event, and his relationship with companies in this area are why it has raised over one and a half million dollars since its, ince its inception in 2001. So, Scott, congratulations for this award. And his wife, who's not here today, also uh, accepts this award as well. And our final award uh, this afternoon is for Volunteer of the Year. This award recognizes a dynamic volunteer for his or her excellent service in support of the Foundation's mission in the past calendar year. They typically excel in activities such as fundraising, obtaining media, presenting to service groups, recruiting team captains and chapter leadership, introducing major gift donor prospects and serving in chapter and event committees. This year, we actually have two outstanding volunteers receiving this award. Phi, Phi Mo from our Western region. And Jason Bergstein from our Northeastern region. So let me give you a little bit of background. Phi is a team captain for the Arizona Vision Walk. He was also the chair of their Dining in the Dark, in the Dark fundraiser. And Phi is the local chapter president and a member of the Arizona Vision Walk committee. So Phi, please come up here and accept your award.
unfortunately, uh, Jason could not be here with us uh, this weekend. I believe he was at his uh, freshman year orientation at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I actually had sent a text message to his father, uh, Jordan Bergstein. Those of you that might famili be familiar with the Bergstein family, uh, Jason is now like third generation that's involved um, with the foundation. And I'll give you a little bit of background as to why he uh, is being given this award. Jason is the organizer of an independent fundraising event called Bowling for a Cure. At the age of 17, Jason is following in his parents' and his grandparents' footsteps as he engages his friends and their families to build the Bowling for a Cure event. This was the first year that Jason built a strong committee to assist with the planning. He also works with his family to, to solicit their contacts which, get this, helped raise $127,222 for the two 2017 event. A bolathon raised $127,000. So again, thank you to everybody in this room, and again, recognizing uh, all the, the great leaders here in this room. Uh, we really appreciate everything that you've done to further the mission of the foundation and to continue to raise funds for us. So now to introduce our keynote speaker for the afternoon, uh, I'd like to reintroduce our CEO, Dr. Ben Yerksa. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, again. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today's keynote speaker, Dr. Emmett Cunningham. Emmett received his MD and MPH in epidemiology from Johns Hopkins University and a PhD in neuroscience from UC San Diego, my alma mater, uh, for his work done at the Salk Institute just up the road. He completed his residency in ophthalmology and a fellowship in medical retina and uveitis at Moorfields Eye Hospital, which is another one of those gateway institutions uh, that trains some of the top people in the world in London, and then a fellowship in public health ophthalmology at the Wilmer Eye Institute at Hopkins, another major gateway institution. Emmett's an internationally recognized physician scientist. These are rare combinations, and when you look at his track record, Emmett's got 350 plus publications, is an adjunct clinical professor of ophthalmology at Stanford, and still sees patients on a weekly basis. You think about this, with all this tremendous training, uh, medical training in ophthalmology and public health, Emmett entered industry uh, for a short time at Pfizer, and then he helped to build and be a founding team member of a startup called iTech Pharmaceuticals. You may have heard of iTech. They were the ones who uh, discovered and pioneered the first anti-VEGF agent for the treatment of wet age-related macular degeneration, a drug called Macugen. He then joined Claris, a venture capital firm, in 2006, where he now uh, leads investments in new startup companies in ophthalmology. Some notable investments are companies like Optitech, Sarcode, Graybug Vision, and Exxon, and others. These are all very successful companies and probably some familiar names to you. And what's interesting about Emmett is he, he's really kept his finger on the pulse of ophthalmology uh, by being a founding member and a chairman of something called the Ophthalmology Innovation Summit. And this has really expanded to become uh, essentially a, a pre-meeting before all the major ophthalmology meetings uh, on the calendar in the U.S. And it's essentially a go-to meeting. The, what we call the OIS meeting is really where the entire ecosystem of ophthalmology gets together to talk about all the latest innovations. And this is part of Emmett's creation, and it's a way for him to really pull everything together and root for ophthalmology as a really a breeding ground for new innovations. So it's really my pleasure today to introduce Emmett Cunningham today to give the keynote address on trends in ophthalmic innovation, a 25-year perspective. Emmett? Thank you, thank you for that kind introduction, Ben. I'm, I'm much more of a physician than a scientist these days. I, I don't really do science, haven't for a long time. Uh, first, let me say I have slides, and um, the slides are for me, really. They, they'll keep me on track 
for me on track for my talk and the main points I want to make. Uh, some of the slides have images and, and details, and they're largely unimportant. If they are important, I'll do my best to describe them and walk people, walk the entire group through it. I also want to invite anyone to interrupt me at any time. If you have questions or want clarification, just clap or raise your hand, and we'll stop and go through it. We have plenty of time. This is typically about a 20 to 30 minute talk, and we have more time than that. I recognize that the topic itself, innovation, and how an investor, physician investor, thinks about innovation broadly and in ophthalmology is new to many of you. So I really want you to, to take away some of the impor important points and learnings I've had over the years. Uh, this slide is sort of my own timeline, and it's, uh, it has a lot of detail on it, which again is irrelevant. But the relevant point is that I've, I'm, I'm old now, and I've seen and done a fair <laughs> amount. Um, I've had training, lucky enough to be at some very good institutions, entered uh, academics in ophthalmology. I was on faculty at UCSF for nearly a decade. And for reasons we can go over, over coffee perhaps, uh, decided to transition into phar pharma, big pharma first at Pfizer, and then a small company, iTech, and then ultimately into investing. And through that investing vehicle, I've focused on ophthalmology and have seen and done a lot of ophthalmic in, in investing. My career, personal career in ophthalmology started about 1990 when I did my public health uh, ophthalmology fellowship and my MPH with Al Somer at Wilmer. And I have on this slide some photographs of two people in particular, Steve Kramer and Dan Schwartz, both at UCSF, who were, were innovators themselves. Steve was a founder of Insight, uh, you may know, was recently acquired by Sun, a company, and this was in the 70s when physicians just didn't do that. And Dan is uh, um, the founder of RX Site, an uh, uh, intraocular lens company. Again, so UCSF had a culture that allowed me to explore my interests and really be a little bit of A and a little bit of B. Uh, the last point that's on this slide is what I currently focus on, which is ocular inflammation and infections. For most of my academic career, I treated patients who had HIV AIDS. And as you may know, many of those patients went blind. Uh, uveitis, as we call it, is the cause of about 20% of blindness uh, worldwide. So I still see and care for those patients. Another busy slide, details not important, it lists all the companies that we have in our por investment portfolio and the five or six or seven that are ophthalmic com companies. This is sort of my disclosure side. I am an investor. Uh, I do look at and profit from these companies that we invest in. Not always, sometimes I lose money in these companies. <laughs> Try not to do that too often. But um, you can see that we're, we're active far beyond op ophthalmology. It turns out that within pharma, about 60% of the, the effort is on oncology. And perhaps not undeserved, about a third of us die of cancer and half of us die with cancer. So it's still a big problem and, and that's where much of the effort and attention goes. I want to focus first on some global or secular trends that are not just ophthalmic. They touch on the entire industry and then I'll turn to ophthalmology because I think that's particularly exciting. One big trend, and this is most relevant for tools and techniques and devices, is that we're moving to less invasive and improved outcomes. And some of you may recognize the buzzwords, minimally invasive, microsurgery, et cetera, et cetera. I always like to tell people that if you take a, a well-trained fellow out of, say, retina or cornea today, that person is a better surgeon than the best in the world 20 years ago. So the advances, both technically and, and from a skill perspective, are tremendous. And much of this has to do with miniar miniaturization, microization, smaller incisions, smaller implants, et cetera, et cetera. And it moves forward at a, at a steady, I would say, steady, steady space. I could, I could list certain examples, fake emulsification for cataract or small implants for glaucoma, I'll touch on those later, small gauge surgery or small size surgery for vitrectomy or retinal surgery. There are many, many, many out there. But I want to focus today on the innovation and how we think about it and, and what the reality is in that world. I always tell people there's a big difference between products and companies. To have a company, it needs to be big. It needs to warrant the expense and effort of building that company. And these are typically drugs or devices that feel like drugs. That is, they take a lot of money and a lot of time to develop. And I like to say that in the pharma world, at any rate, investors won't even think about a, a developing a company unless the product can, can generate a revenue of about $400 million a year, which is a lot of money in anybody's world. 
There are many things that don't do that. There are tools, there are small devices, and there are what we call 510K devices. These are devices that are sort of an incremental improvement over something that already exists. But there are a minority. And so you can see that many of the devices feel a lot like drugs when it, co when it comes to cost and timeline to, to develop them. Again, another graphic, but this is basically just a, a series of, of co columns showing the size of the cost for these various things. And tools cost about, to develop a surgical tool might be a half a million dollars or even less in many instances, whereas a, a, a 510K device, one that is an incremental improvement, can be um, maybe 10 times that, just a few million dollars. And when you get to a drug or a device that has to go through the FDA with the same rigor as a drug, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions in, in some instances. And for the biggest drugs, drugs that are diabetes drugs, blood pressure drugs, where they have to study thousands and thousands of patients to show relatively small changes, uh, they can cost billions of dollars to develop. And so it, it is a very expensive thing. And that leads to my last point related to largely devices, which is it's hard to develop devices today. And I've listed some bullet points, which I'll read first. It just costs more and takes longer to develop devices. The FDA wants to apply the same rigor to a device as we've applied to drugs, which makes sense. But the reality is that devices just don't generate the income that drugs uh, generate. A, a good device might generate an income of about, let's say, $50 million. Well, if it costs $200 million to get that approved, you can see why not many people will race to make that investment. And I, I apologize if this sounds like a very material and money-driven talk, but I want you to understand what's driving those people who facilitate the innovation, because I think it's very important. Uh, the, other, the other aspect, which is a little bit specialized to maybe my world, and that is that on the drug side, the drug companies w who have the deepest pockets and who can step in to facilitate development, they're willing to step in a little earlier and take a little more risk. And they do that because maybe they're used to living in that world and because they have to. If they want to be competitive and get these exciting new molecules, they have to come in earlier and pay a little more, take a little more risk to have the bigger payoff. And they are bigger payoffs for drug companies typically. Device companies don't do that. They just don't. They want to wait until a device is completely de-risked. They want it to be approved. They want it to be genera generating revenue. And ideally, they want it to be profitable. They want it to be a proven winner. And even then, they're not willing to pay a lot for it. And it's that's just a reality of that world. So all this is to say, that while tools and devices are improving, and remember, the takeaway is the fellow today is better than the best surgeon 20 years ago, it's a slower pace of, of advance, I think, for because of these financial constraints. And that's all I'm going to say about devices and tools. The rest of my talk is going to be mostly about drugs, which is, I think, the most relevant for ophthalmology and clearly the most relevant for, for blinding disorders in much of ophthalmology. Point number two. Um, <laughs> you know, I uh, thank you for that, Jason. I, <laughs> I I was watching an amazing speaker the other day. He was a politician, and he the, the audience sometimes doesn't know when to applaud or clap. And he had this amazing technique. Whenever he wanted an, an applause, merited or not, he would just say thank you very much, and everybody would <laughs> applaud. So maybe I should try that after the the next point. Okay. So point number two. Uh, we're moving from repurpose to novel drugs. Ophthalmology, dermatology are the two spaces where, more than any other, uh, scientists, drug developers have taken drugs that have already existed, corticosteroids is, is a great example and one I'm very familiar with, and then applied it to the eye. So we had corticosteroids to treat inflammation as pills and injections for decades. Somebody had to put it into a drop or make an eye-compatible eye injection to give it to the eye. And the biggest ophthalmology houses were built on that. Alcon, Allergan, those companies which are hugely successful and uh, tremendously valuable companies, both for themselves, their stockholders, and for patients, built their business on that approach. That, that era, I think, is largely over. Um, we need now to move to truly innovative, sort of first-in-class, first-target, drugs to treat diseases for many, many reasons. I, I think the first is that they work better. When we understand the biology and we can treat the biology, we get a better effect. But the practical reality is that the payers, the insurance companies, are not going to pay for a drug, a drop that you take twice a day as opposed to three times a day. They won't pay for convenience or a little bit more safety. They really want 
us as investors and the drug companies to focus on disruptive drugs. And so that is a clear change that's going forward. There are about 4,000 active clinical trials uh, going on now in the United States. That's, that's a lot. And about two-thirds of them are in late-stage development, phase two and phase three, we call that. But if you look at how many new drugs actually get approved each year, it's less than 5% of that. It's about 46 uh, last year, and two years ago it was 45, and the year before that, 41. So it's a relatively small number of drugs get developed, again, highlighting how risky it is. The good news is that the number is increasing. So whereas 10 years ago it was about 24, last year it was 46. And it is getting better. We are getting incrementally more drugs out there. The reality is that a good proportion of them are focused on hematology and oncology, about 30% right now, are focused on blood cancers and solid organ cancers. Again, it's a huge unmet need, and I've mentioned how often it touches us. It touches everyone, either directly or indirectly. About 40%, so even more, this is the good news for us, are focused on what we call rare and orphan diseases. These are uncommon, often genetically linked inherited diseases. Retinitis pigmentosa being a perfect example or congenital glaucoma, or the retinal inherited disorder. So about 40% of them focus on this. And there are very specific reasons why this group of patients get the attention. One is there's a huge unmet need. Obviously, those of you who live with these conditions know how big the unmet need is. Uh, the second reason is that it's often scientifically easier to get to them. We know the defect, we know the gene, we know how the gene works, we know how that translates. So we can create an identical disease in animals and have a much better animal model. So that if we get a drug that treats an animal with the exact same change, genetic change, we believe, and it's borne out, that we can develop a drug with a greater success rate to get to patients. It also is true, again, this is the reality, that, that the drug makers can charge more for these medicines. Uh, and, they, and they do. As you all know, some of these medicines are hugely expensive. And so from a shareholder perspective, they like it because they can push, uh, push more drugs to approval successfully. I think the regulators like it because the, the advocates, whether it's oncology, hematology, or these rare diseases, have said, we, w we need more. You're not giving us enough attention. So all of those things come together to to produce what I show in this slide, which is a 40% of, of current drugs are in rare and orphan diseases. Now, the Food and Drug Administration has some vehicles to facilitate drug development, and they go by fancy names like priority review, accelerated review, fast, fast track breakthrough therapy. They're, they're all programs that Congress has instituted to facilitate the development of these drugs, and they are very, very effective. It turns out that <laughs> um, about two-thirds to three-quarters of those are in oncology and, and rare and orphan diseases. So again, um, the patients want it and the FDA wants it. So there is actually, although, although sometimes it doesn't feel like it, there's lots of attention in drug development going on these conditions, and, and the results have been largely positive. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I won't do that again, I promise. Uh, Point number three, uh, precision. We're moving to personalized uh, therapeutics. And this is a sort of an extension of the point I just made, which is that we are li really in this genetic revolution. We can now sequence anybody's entire genome in this room for probably under $100. The number changes almost every day. And that sequencing and ability to understand has allowed us to, to basically come up with targets that are real and relevant targets much more quickly. Conversely, as we understand how each patient with the same disease, as you all know as well or better than I, retinitis pigmentosa is not one condition. There are many mutations that give rise to the same disease we call retinitis pigmentosa, and the patients within that spectrum have a wide, wide range of vision, visual field loss, functionality, et cetera. And so as we understand the genetics, we can get targets, and then we can design trials that have comparable patients. You have a mix of patients in a given trial, it's much harder to, to see, a, see an effect. Some of them may not even be able to, to respond to a drug. So for all these reasons, personalization is great. Uh, we all know and applauded the approval of um, 
uh, Luxterna by Spark, the, the first gene therapy uh, in this country and the first for use in op ophthalmology. This is a real, as you all know, a real milestone for the space. And um, it was a huge event for medicine and for ophthalmology. There are no less than 16 companies. Uh, they're probably twice this. this. These are the ones I could get, and I pulled some of my friends in the, in the industry that are working on gene therapies in ophthalmology. So gene therapies in ophthalmology is a, it's a very active area, and I, I think we're going to see many, many more advances in the coming years. And even outside of ophthalmology, there are now over 500 gene therapy uh, companies. 500. It's amazing. So gene therapy is here to, com here to stay, and it's going to have a huge impact. And it's probably, at least for this audience, the most direct uh, direct effect or direct impact on, um, on vision and the ophthalmic disorders. Uh, the fourth area I want to touch on, again, we're talking about just the broad areas, is funding uh, and how this all gets paid for. It's it is largely now, and it's increasing every year, a private enterprise. And we'd like to think that the government would do it, but uh, the reality is that most of it is not. This slide I need to describe, and it's a, a little bit busy, but I want to talk about it. It basically shows three circles that go from left to right, and the circles represent stages of developing a drug in this instance. So from laboratory research to clinical research to treatments or approved drugs, you might call it. Superimposed on these circles, which go from left to right, are the where the money comes from to fund it. And on the far left are the earliest funding sources. Uh, I would say the National Eye Institute, National Institute of Health, are the very earliest. And that's where we understand the science, we identify the targets, et cetera. It's about 16 years from finding a target to getting a drug on average. It can be many, many more years, and it can be in rare instances less. But it's a very long and expensive trip. Uh, after the NEI, after the scientists come up with a, a target and they have a, an intellectual uh, patent intellectual property portfolio to protect it because they won't spend the money to protect it if they can't profit from it. Unfortunately, again, it comes down to our, our so social reality. Um, there are various avenues to get this very early money. Angel investors can do it. Um, the government itself has a small program I'll touch on called the SBIR grant, small business grants. There are foundations like Foundation Fighting Blindness that play a tremendous role for this. And from that, we then go to venture capitalists who usually give anywhere from one to hundreds of million. And from that, we go to industry. And you'll see industry, although sometimes it's vilified or pilloried, it really does, in my, my mind, play a tremendous role. And you'll see we wouldn't have any of these innovations without them. They spend an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude more on developing drugs than any of the other institutions. Now, they have their motives, but I have lots of friends in industry, and I would like to think that the largest motive is to help all of you uh, who are sitting in this audience. Um, I show here on a slide what the NEA, NEI, National Institute, funding has been over time. And the main point of the slide is that it was going up until maybe about 2001, 2002, and then it's been flat on, on actual dollars. And if you inflation adjusted, it's actually been down. So in the last year, 2017, there was about 731 million in the National Institute budget. Uh, in adjusting for inflation from 10 years ago, it's about 410 million. So while the National Institute's funding has remained flat, it's actually come down quite a bit. So you can see the government is not, wor not really stepping in. They are stepping in with this smallish program called SBIR. This is, this is intended specifically for science that is compelling enough to think that you can build a company out of it and take it to be a product, a real product. And they, they spent about $22 million on that last year. So just a fraction of the $700 million, I think they could do much more with this. But for many, many reasons, this is not a priority at our institutes. The venture capitalists, and I'm one of them, they, this is where most of that early funding comes from. On this slide, we show that last year it was $6.6 .6 billion dollars that went into biotech and about $3.1 billion that went into devices. Now that's broadly, it's not ophthalmology, but you can imagine it's, again, much, much more than the, the government is spending. If you look at the very earliest funding, what we call seed companies, uh, they, uh, these on this graph, and I apologize for those of you who can't see the, see the graph, but we're showing now numbers of companies and not dollars. The point being that there are two lines here, a blue one, which is drug companies going up and to the right, and device companies, which is going down and to the right. 
there are many fewer device companies than there are drug companies because, as I mentioned in one of my early sections, it's just difficult to develop devices, unfortunately. Uh, and this, this slide shows what we actually see in ophthalmology, and it makes the same point, that ophthalmology is sort of in a renaissance now. We have, since about 2001, 2002, you can see a, a sort of an explosion of uh, numbers and of companies and amount of money going into those companies. And you also see that relatively uh, recently the device, device investments have trailed off. Um, the investments have gone into many areas. The most active areas have been retina, macular degeneration in particular, followed by glaucoma, and then um, to a less extent dry eye and some anterior segment uh, conditions, vision refraction, et cetera, et cetera. But retina, which is the focus of the foundation, is, is, is by far the most active area, area for many, many reasons. It's the most common cause of vision loss um, in both the developed and developing worlds. And a point I wanted to make here, complex slide, probably better if you don't see it because it's not a very good slide. But it compares the number, the dollar amounts that are coming in from the government versus venture capital versus the drug companies. And it's very hard to get the numbers from the drug companies. So I only had one. And I had this one because the CEO mentioned it at a meeting. So I, I compared the amount coming in to up to at the National Eye Institute, let's say $700 million, from ve versus venture capital, about $500 million, versus Alcon, which was one company at that time in 2015. That was a billion. And if, so if you can imagine, if you add the 15 companies, it might be 10 or $15 billion that's coming in from the company. Just to make the point that these companies, I think, are tremendously important. We wouldn't have the clinical development without them. Uh, I, I granted that we could all live better lives and they could be better citizens, global and corporate citizens in some instances, but they play a very important role for, for us and the patients. Uh, the last sort of big mega point, which is a global point, is that innovation, while it's been driven mostly in the United States and to a lesser extent in Europe, is going to go offshore. And I can't tell you if it's going to take five years or 50 years, but it's going to happen as sure as uh, day follows night. Uh, there are about 1.3 billion people in India and 1.4 in China. That's Those numbers don't lie. And what I always like to say is, or the point I like to point out is related to this quote. The, the quote we all recognize is that necessity may be the mother of invention, and I think it is, but prosperity is the father of innovation. And that's my quote. Thank you very much. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the, point, the point I wanted to make with that quote is that it takes a rich society to innovate. If you have other concerns, Ethiopia is not going to be a center of innovation. It just has other pressing concerns. We have been historically because we've been tremendously prosperous. I personally believe we are prosperous and we will continue to innovate. I think we could do more. I wish we supported our government more in this instance. But as you saw from the NIH and AI funding, we just have decided not to. We've decided socially not to. Um, if you look over the centuries, the great centers of culture and finance and prosperity a thousand years ago were China and India and the Middle East. And then they went into a relative decline relative to the Western world, Europe, and then the United States. But if you talk to the people who think about this and project out to 2030 and 2060, more than half the world's GDP or economic growth is going to come from India and China. It just is. That's the reality. They'll have their stumbling, stumbling, and they will become the centers of prosperity, and they will become the innovators who will take that risk. There are many, many data points that show that they're already developing lots of drugs, putting them through the regulatory authorities. And just, I took, I have pasted on here some headlines out of the news. I'll read them. Biotech booms in China. Venture capitalist puts 260 million into new Chinese biotech. Forbes. Chinese money floods U.S. biotech as Beijing chases new cures. Bloomberg. These are all within months, and I could have put 30 or 40 more. So China and India are not only going to invest in their own regional uh, development, they are going to come to America and leverage all the expertise we have here. They're going to come to Europe, and I think that's a good thing. So that's sort of the end of the global trends that I think are important and going to impact every part of drugs, all the drugs we take that are not ophthalmic as well as ophthalmic. And I wanted to just end here, the, the last part of this, on the ophthalmic trends, because I think uh, this group should be interested in it. I'm interested in it. Um, <laughs> this is another slide that you, you're probably luckier if you don't see. It's intended to have the impact that there are many, many companies, private companies now in ophthalmology. It's a slide that just shows 
uh, the development stage versus the area, glaucoma, dry eye, AMD, and other. And there are literally hundreds of companies, so, so small to print that none of us can read this unless perhaps you're right up against the screen. That's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. We have lots and lots of innovators chasing lots and lots of causes of uh, vision loss and disability. Um, among these, I want to highlight a couple points. First is intravitreal injection. Uh, by a round of applause, who here has had an intravitreal injection? Yeah, it's very common. It's very common, and it's very scary for those of you who have not had it. I mean, uh, we, if your doctor said you're going to get a stick in the eye, I don't think you'd be uh, very happy with that. That said, it's a procedure that – this is it, actually. This is a photograph of the needle going into the eye. And, and for many of you who can see it, it's a disturbing picture. But I wanted you to see it. It's, um, it, it's scary, but it is not uncomfortable if it's performed correctly, and it's tremendously effective. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be at iTech in 2004 when we got the first approval for the first anti-VEGF agent, now the agents we use for macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, vein occlusion, et cetera. And we spent a lot of time understanding how to do this and how to do this correctly. We wrote a guidelines with an expert panel. We've updated it in 2014. Uh, if you look at the sheer number of in intraocular injections that are being done, they have more than double the number of cataracts. We do about 3 million cataracts a year in this country, and now we're well over 6 million intraocular injections. So it went from a, a, an approach, let's say 15 years ago, where people said, never happen, patients won't tolerate it, it's too risky, too many side effects, where now it is the most common intraocular procedure and the most effective way to treat many of our otherwise debilitating diseases. Um, there are about 26 million intraocular injections done around the world, uh, and this, this number is a few years old now. The vast majority of them are for anti-VEGF agents for the diseases I mentioned, but we use it for others, and some of the gene therapies you've heard about, cell therapies, will use these approaches. The three agents that are anti-VEGF agents, you may recognize the names, Lucentis, Ilea, and Avastin. They're all great drugs, truly transformative drugs. See, the, these have taken uh, patients with AMD from inexorable vision loss to now actually the potential for vision gain and stabilization. So I feel personally particularly proud to have been part of this, uh, this last 15, 18 years of, of drug development. Uh, retina specifically, what, what would I pick as one major advance? Well, I think one of the big things is improved compliance. We, we know that if, you're, if, you're, if you have wet macular degeneration and you are prescribed Lucentis, you should get about 12 of those injections a year, 13 actually. And we know in real world, because patients tend to be about 75, it's hard to get them to the office, um, because physicians like to try to monitor and, and decrease the treatment burden, they actually get about six injections. But every study that's ever been done has shown that if you actually could get that elderly patient into the office for all 13, they would do better, and most of them will. So compliance in the, on the side of the retina is a really big issue. Um, I'm going to skip that. And it's a real big motivator for the companies because it's over half of all the drugs that are sold in ophthalmology are related to retina, mostly in the mind, these anti-VEGF agents. So everybody wants to understand it. I won't keep that up too long. Um, we've already figured it out for steroids. Those of you, I treat uveitis patients. We use a lot of steroids that are injected next to or into the eye. And we've figured out how to make these, this particular class of drugs last for months to up to years in some cases with formulation and implant technology. So we know how to do it for some drugs. We're still learning how to do it for many, especially the bio so-called biologics, antibodies and whatnot. And there are many technologies that are sort of not yet approved in drug development that are moving forward to get away from this need for um, an injection a month or every other month so that you can set it and forget it. You inject once a year or you put an implant in that lasts even longer than that. This is a huge push for investors, for industry, and I think for those of you who have to deal with frequent um, treatments, well, even for drops, we, we will get to a point where that burden will be less, and it won't be too long from now. Genentech has perhaps the most advanced. We should hear about their data uh, this year in their so-called ladder study, where they have a small reservoir that gets refilled every, could be every three or six months, depends what the data show, and that I think will be a big breakthrough. If you look at glaucoma, it's the same issue. It's really compliance. It's very hard 
to take the drops you should take every day, especially if one is twice a day, another is three times a day, and then there's the one only at bedtime, and oh my goodness, I forgot that drop yesterday, what do I do today? Very, very difficult. Um, if you look at the, the numbers, uh, glaucoma is a big part of the industry. It's about 20% of all drugs sold, and so it's important from the to the business side, but by six months, half the patients, by six months, half patients don't take their drops anymore. They just stop. No matter what they tell their doctors, they just don't take them. And we know that because studies have put trackers in the bottle to see what how, how they're using it. They'll come in and say, yep, I'm using it, but the bottle's not being used. So we know it's about half as, half as, uh, half the compliance. And if you look at a year, it drops to 20%, and by four years, it's 10 to 15%. So we could get much less vision loss, much do much better if we could help patients be more compliant with these complex treatment regimens. Um, if you look on the procedure side in glaucoma, so that's the, the drug side. If you look on the procedure side in glaucoma, they're, they're relatively few uh, as all ophthalmic procedures go, these so-called trabeculectomies and tube implantations. And I think that's be been because they are big, difficult, and uh, procedures that are hard to manage. And you, you have to have a real expert do that surgery and manage it after the operation. In the right hands, it can be very, very successful. But it's a complicated surgery. And re remember, we're trying to move to less invasive and more predictable and precise, which we're doing. So what's in the pipeline? We have lots of sustained release technology on glaucoma side that'll, that'll allow the drug to be released over anywhere from three up to 12 months. And so for those of you who take a drop once or twice a day, this might mean you go in once a year to either have the reservoir placed or filled to have the, uh, the, the implant placed, for example. It'll be much less burdensome, and we will know that at month 12, it's not 20%, it's 100% or very close to it, so the treatment effect should be that much better. We also have very small micro size instruments that do essentially the same or very close to what the big surgeries of the past did, the trabeculectomy and the tube placement. So you have these miniature tiny implants. I have here on the slide a picture of a US penny, and one of the implants is about the size of the two on the 2003 date on the penny. So you can see it's a it's truly a micro device that gets implanted to lower the pressure. And there are many of them um, that, are, that are either approved or in development. I've shown some pictures of them here for those of you who can follow the slides. Uh, they're, they're all small, that's the point. They're all comparably sized, very minimally invasive, much few, many fewer complications in the post-op period. This will transform glaucoma. It'll go from a high morbidity surgery where we all really don't want to do it. We, we try to add a second drop or a third drop or the laser treatment to one where we will go earlier to these less invasive surgeries and save more vision. And on this slide, I show the growth in these procedures currently and as they're projected, they're, it's just going to explode. And so if, if you have glaucoma and you see your glaucoma physician, I, my bet is that if they haven't, they will soon be talking to you about these so-called MIGs, just like the Russian fighter plane, minimally or micro-invasive glaucoma surgeries because they're changing the world. Um, cataract, the last point I want to make here is cataract. It is still the largest cause of vision loss worldwide. In, our, in the West, where surgery is common and one might say occasionally done even too early, it's not a major cause of blindness because they get taken out. In much of the world, they don't get taken out because it, it takes a lot to set up a sterile operating room, to have all the equipment, to get the intraocular lenses and all the measuring devices you need to put it in to the patients. And so as I said, many, many people around the world die blind from a preventable cause, cataract. That's, it's over half of the cause of world blindness, as you can see, and it's still a huge number of procedures even with that, second only to the intraocular injections now. So what is the big advance on cataract? I, I show here two papers, one in science, one in nature, that demonstrate that in animals, you can actually reverse the cataract with drops. And it's a somewhat complicated science. Um, nature has made intraocular lenses with a very limited number of proteins called crystallins, an apt name because it forms crystal, which is clear. These crystallins associate or dimerize in a very predictable way in a very repeated structure that allows the light to go through without causing an opacification. Just like glass has its own structure that allows for clarity, the cataract has its own protein structure that allows for light to go through. Now, as we age, unfortunately, those proteins get modified 
and that bond, which keeps them in the right shape, changes and they get out of orientation. These drops pull them back into orientation and allow the light to go back through. It's really an amazing uh, piece of science that's been done. It's now been shown in mice and in dogs to work uh, very well. It not only, not only does it improve the clarity, it also restores the flexibility of the lens. And so the people uh, get back the ability to read close. What we, it reverses presbyopia, at least in animals. And so these drugs hold the promise of taking both surgery and age-related uh, near vision loss, so-called presbyopia, to, a, to the medical front to drops, which will really make this uh, a much, much easier thing to treat worldwide. So that there are my comments. I now will end with a real thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions, anybody who has them. Uh, there's a hand in the back. I'll repeat the question. Oh, I'm we sorry. Actually have one. We have one right over there first. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, during the first section of your talk, you referred to uh, tools and devices, and I caught a little bit of the uh, one example there at the end. Can you define those terms more precisely and, and you know give us more examples in the field of ophthalmology? Yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. So a tool might be, on the on, in the most simple form, a, a pair of scissors that we use to cut the iris if we need to remove an intraocular lens, or it may be a hook that we need to move the iris, or a forcep or, or, or a pair of tweezers that we would use to pull a scar off of the retina. They would be tools. Uh, devices can be simple. In the case of a small tube that I showed on one of the slides, less than the size of the two on the 2003 date of the penny, that we would put into the eye to help facilitate fluid fluid egress or fluid flow. That could be a very simple, small device. And then there are very complex devices. You might recognize sort of a cardiac pacemaker, which has electricity, it, and nowadays they have programming, an insulin pump that can both sense the uh, insulin in your, glucose in your blood and release the appropriate amount of insulin. So they are the more complex devices that we see. I was an investor in a company called Restoration Robotics, which is robotic hair transplantation. Uh, so this robot removed the follicle, made the site preparation, implanted the follicle, did everything. And we're getting to a, a stage where uh, amazing things are really capable with the devices. The problem is uh, it, devices have those challenges. Did, did that answer your question, sir? Thank you. Uh, we've, got, we've got one right there. I have to let the people with the microphone pick who's going to ask the question because I don't want to interrupt anybody. Thank you for your presentation. I found it to be very informative. You're welcome. Um, but at the very end, something struck me. You were talking about the uh, cataracts and the eye drops, I guess, that uh, are helping to reverse uh, that cataract. And you said something at the very end, something about those that need the reading glasses, I guess. Right. Uh, for those of us that are fully sighted and of a certain age, we need reading glasses even if your vision is 20-20. And I'm curious if that's what you meant when you said that uh, this treatment could help that condition. Yeah. So um, when we're very young as a child, we, we have the ability to change the shape of our intraocular lens. The, the, it's just like the lens you use to focus the sunlight on the paper when you're a child. We have the ability to change the thickness of that lens by squeezing a muscle inside of our eye. That's called accommodation. And that allows a 10-year-old to see a distance perfectly clear and to read a, a book up close with the finest of print. As we age, the, that lens hardens. And so no matter how much strong the muscle is, it can't change the shape. And it just turns out that for most people who don't need glasses, there's a magic age of about 40 to 44 where you lose the ability to read books and newspaper. And you have to then put on the readers, the reading glasses. And it continued, you continue to use it, lose it until you're 50, 60, or 70 and just need more and more powerful glasses. So that's what happens to most people who don't need glasses. If you happen to need glasses, um, what, what, what are called hyperopic glasses, if you're what we call farsighted, you need that. That happens even earlier because you, the way your eye is built, it, tend, it actually is a little smaller, you, that comes on sooner. So hyperopes, it happens even earlier. And if you're nearsighted or myopic, then um, 
you actually can take off your glasses to read. You take off your glasses and you can see perfectly up close, but you can't see at all in distance. And people who have that condition never need reading glasses technically. They can always take off their glasses. Um, but if they have cataract surgery, then they need, they, they need reading glasses. So that's, that's what we call presbyopia. Uh, opia meaning vision and presby age. So it's age-related vision loss that we see uh, typically in the early 40s. Does that answer your question, sir? The drops that reverse the effects of cataracts, is it a drop you take forever or is it a drop that you take and eventually you stop taking once it's cleared up the cataract? It's a great question. You know, does it last forever or how do you take it or how do we use it? Uh, let me emphasize they were mice and I mentioned dogs, so we're very early um, in this process. We know it reverses. We don't know how durable or how long it lasts. We don't know if it's something that you would need to use forever or once a year or for a month or two every year. That all needs to be figured out in clinical trials. And it, there's, it, it's entirely possible that it works in mice but not in us. So again, it's very early. Um, it's hopeful but very early. Yeah. Um, my, my question actually is going to the trends from India and China. So I can see the, the economic incentive that goes on there. But can you talk about the translation to market as far as drugs go? As we know, in the U.S., you had already pointed out 16 years to get a drug to market. Do you see an acceleration pattern in the U.S. in terms of this innovation occurring in these other countries? Um, it's a complex question, sort of it has multiple parts to it. I'll, I'll, I'll give a couple comments. Maybe they touch on those parts. We have, I, there are people who like to blame the FDA for lots of things. And the FDA is bureaucratic, it's government, and it could be better. All that said, I think it is clear we have the finest uh, drug regulatory agency in the world. None is close. And the people there go to great extent, great measures to make sure we have what they are mandated to give us, which is safe and effective. And it's hard, efficacy, efficacy pardon me, Efficacy itself is hard to show, but safety too is quite, uh, quite challenging. And, and so you need to have lots and lots of patients to be able to identify these low incident events. And I think we all want that. So I, I'm never, I've never been one to, to tell the FDA to slow, to speed it up. Get us those drugs that work, but they might kill us. Nobody wants that. It's just the reality. What we really need to do is figure out ways to do quicker, less expensive trials. For example, by genetic screening and picking the right patients. We need to figure out ways to pick a better target so that we get a better success rate. Right now, to go from target to drug, it's about a 2% success rate. And even if you get it into first in human trials, it's about an 8% success rate. So it's just, we're not very good at figuring out from the target what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. We need to, we need to improve that. Now to answer your question, those regulations are less stringent in other countries. And in China, they're less stringent. And there's also the other complicating factor that what works is what the government wants to work. And so w if the government wants a company to survive, it will make sure it survives, it'll help it, it'll subsidize it, et cetera. And there's corruption. We have corruption, obviously, but there's more of it in some of those countries. And so it's complicated. I, I, there will be costs, but they will iterate faster. They will, they'll do it like we did it 40 years ago. And um, they'll advance drugs, they will. I have a question for you. You spoke about um, there was a drug that they put in the eyes for cataracts yeah. and you had to go into the office once a month or something and you found that um, as the years went by, <coughs> excuse me, um, the patients were going in less and less or not using it as often as they should. Do you think that's related to the cost of the actual prescription and also the cost of the doctor visit? Yeah, so um, let me broaden your question to what, why are we seeing decreased compliance? I think uh, there are many reasons. There's forgetfulness, there's inconvenience, some, some drops sting, for example, and there is cost. These are expensive drops that, as you may or may not be aware, well, I'm sure you're aware if you buy and use drugs, the co-pays are going up and up and up what the insurance company is asking us to pay. And that's their way to get patients to tell the doctors, 
control the prices. And it, it's working. You know, peop- we are now having this debate in our country about how much should a drug price increase every year? What should be the fair price for a drug given the, the billion dollar development costs? Um, so yes, I think price is a real issue. I didn't talk about it. That's another mega trend, which is that pricing is not going to increase like it, di- it has. And what, what does that mean specifically? It means that those traditionally expensive drugs that drug companies wanted to develop, cancer drugs and rare and orphan drugs, they're not going to go after uh, forever. As those prices come down, it'll, they won't financially be able to develop a drug that treats a thousand patients. They just won't be able to do it. So um, I'd like to think that I'd see a solution for that, but I don't have an obvious answer right now. You mentioned intellectual property before. Um, is that going to become a road, or be it, is that a roadblock to getting CRISPR um, developed into companies? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the complete qu- question completely. Uh, you know, we have a system in this country where we have strong intellectual property laws, and um, we don't in electronics, for example. Uh, people can, you know engineer around and develop two phones and one instance the courts have said steal from another company's phone and develop it and move it forward. Um, those iterative cycles are every year or two and it, so it's a little bit of a different beast in, than drug development. At least that's been the argument the industry has made. And so um, we have very 20 years of patent exclusivity and it takes maybe 15 years to develop the drug. So you can see why we have it. If anybody could wait until the 11th hour and then throw in their drug after someone spent all that money and work, it really wouldn't work very well. Now, I don't know, understand your specific question related to CRISPR. We can't patent, there are patents related to technology, but and we, we, we can't really patent a target, the gene we want to insert or edit out. Um, and we can't really largely patent the way we do it um, there are vectors that are patentable, et cetera, et cetera. And, and if you're going to use a patented technology, you have to get access to that. But it's a little different than a specific molecule in a specific drug. That's another reason, by the way, that people are moving away from repurposed drugs because they're no longer patent protected. And if companies are going to spend a lot of money, they need to be spending it on drugs that are patent protected. Otherwise, they'll, again, spend $500 million and company Z will come in and just sell it, spending rel- relatively little money. Did that answer that question? Well, you mentioned that there were um, different groups that were claiming that they had developed CRISPR first. And there, are, there are technical patents that have to do with the specific use of the technologies that I'm not an expert on and I think do impact uh, what companies get to use them, but to a lesser extent. Okay, I guess I have the next question. Uh, in conjunction with this scene, can we bring one microphone to the front table so you're all in the back and there's some up here? There's a gentleman in a white shirt who's had his hand up for... So, um, in, in, in conjunction with your, your um, seeing innovation moving offshore to the degree to India Ray, and China... Raise your hand. I'm not, I don't see where you're looking. Oh, right here. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so in conjunction with your seeing uh, innovation moving to India and China and other places uh, and, and money coming from there, do you also see the... Uh, scientific expertise moving offshore at the same time, so we're losing our leadership in that? Well, it's, <laughs> I don't know if you've tried to order in Chinese in a Chinese restaurant. I can't do it, and I'm married to a Chinese woman. So it's a big hurdle, but the, the expatriates are returning. They're going back. And uh, that nature article, the point of that nature article was that they're all going back, and they're all getting great jobs, and they're all making a fortune because this is, the, this is their time, their moment, their boom. So they are going back, yes. Any other? Sir, you had one, yes. Yes, that's you. Yeah, Bill. Um, yeah very interesting discussions. Uh, you touched earlier in your discussion about the uh, the National Eye Institute. Now, I know that's been around about 50 years now, just a little bit longer than RP Foundation originally. Um, we live in that area, the D.C. area. I do know overall there's always a, uh, you know, competition for for dollars, in, and um, I guess maybe if you could just comment a little more on that. I recognize that anytime you're trying to get um, dollars for for science and health, there's always a bit of a competition. You know, you see some of these uh, different groups have like celebrities, you know, trying to help them, you know, curry favor with Congress. Um, could you comment 
because I know over the years that um, occasionally the uh, FFD or Poor RP Foundation would kind of solicit <laughs> other, you know, members to uh, encourage like NEI relationships and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I get the sense that we have a, a very positive relationship with, with NEI in terms of getting funding and dollars, but uh, un unfortunately just not close enough to it. And I guess the other piece is in terms of the eye research, can you just comment on that, how we do compared to some of the other organizations? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, so again, it's a complex question. I'll just give some comments and observations from my 25 years. Um, it is a limited budget, obviously. That's the reality. I think the budget could be larger. I would like to see us spend more on the future, whether it's education or science, than we do on the current crises. Um, it seems not to be the nature of politicians and, and many voters, frankly. If you're, if you're unemployed uh, and you, you know, you're not so worried about you know, whose children are going to go to college maybe in 30 years. And so um, that's a bigger political issue I, I'm not sure that I can fix or comment on. I, there, there's something that's undeniable, two things I will say. One is that focused effort makes a difference. You know, we've had this renaissance in cancer therapies because, like him or not, Richard Nixon decided world war on cancer in 1970s, and the institutes of health poured everything into it and, and have driven the, the, the death rate down and the survival rate up for many, many cancers. And we're in, in right in the midst of an yet another renaissance in immuno-oncology. And that's focused attention and dollars. Completely appropriate. It's a huge problem in society, and as I said, it affects... Uh, it affects half of us and, and kills a third of us. So I understand that. Um, not all are elderly conditions. My niece passed away from a childhood cancer not too long ago. Um, but many of them are, whereas blindness often is a young person's condition and so and impacts life, as you all know, for many, many years. Uh, the good thing is we have a National Eye Institute. Carl Kufler set that up. It, it so probably gets more uh, per organ, if you will. Um, we could all argue that it's not enough per organ, given how important vision is, but it does get more. Um, the last point I would say is that the squeaky wheel really gets the attention. And uh, the second great success in medicine after cancer is HIV. And that does not affect nearly as many people, but the, the HIV AIDS advocates, and I was you know, central to that and part of that at the time, Made, they, they essentially cured the condition. Now, it's easier to cure infectious conditions than degenerative conditions, et cetera, et cetera, but that was them not taking no for an answer, and uh, they made that noise. And so for those of you, and I know it's many, who are advocates and want to turn your attention to that, you know, letters to the congressperson help, and they help when they're passed to someone from someone who has reached to that Congressperson, it's it's just the re the reality. I, I a small anecdote. I wanted to look up my father's military service from World War II, and I, I kept writing to the Congress. You have to go through a Congressperson to get the release of the files, et cetera, et cetera. And two years, nothing. So I knew a person who was the former DA in San Francisco who knew Diane Feinstein. One call, I got it a week later. It's uh, you know, it's it's just that's the way the world works. So the networks that you're building here. Um, and where you're very active, I think, are hugely important. And maybe that's what you're getting at. Is I, I, I think it takes you, – you, we all tend to sit at home and think nihilistically that it's not going to make a difference. But it really does make a difference if you make that noise. Um, you will get the attention and you'll get more money and you'll get faster cures. So. Yep. Hi. Thanks for your presentation today. Um, very useful to hear from the investor side of things. So uh, in that vein, you know, we've heard a couple of days of – what sounds like really exciting research uh, in inherited retinal diseases. And I wonder if you could just speak to that from an investor perspective of when you look at this particular field, I is it attractive? Is it not attractive? And from an investment perspective, and why or why not? Uh, it depends. It de the answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. And um, Rule one is success follows success. So every time there's a, a Luxterna, there are more gene therapy companies. Every time there's a Macugen with anti-VEGF, people race in. Every time there's a result that cataract can clarify, companies race in. So um, success is a good thing, and we're having a fair amount of success in various
various aspects of treating ophthalmic disease. There are more companies than there have ever been. There's more money going in than there's ever been, et cetera. But as I look at the amount of money and the number of companies over the last five years, it's, it's kind of flat to up a little bit. So it's good and strong, but it's not continuing to explode. Um, and I'm not quite sure why. I think it's because there's no obvious next great target to chase. One, one thing I don't think we've done very well in many conditions, let's pick glaucoma. We don't understand it very well. We don't have good targets. We don't understand at a molecular level what's causing glaucoma. So we don't have something to target. So the ge there are some genetic disorders that are just now being understood. We're just starting to get to targets. But ophthalmology has not done that well over the, the his my history in it. It's different for the inherited retinal disorders because they, they have been sort of the poster child for understanding genetics and how that translates. So that's a different thing, and that's why you're seeing advances there. But for glaucoma, for cataract, for AMD, you know, VEGF worked um, amazingly well. We're still looking for the next VEGF for that condition. Uh, we just had a drug that was spent 15 years and almost a billion dollars being developed. Failed phase three. So scratched, you know. It's, um, that's the challenge. We, we need to, the NIH, even though we think it's, you know, m a small part of the money, unless you have the target, you don't know where to go. So you need that basic research, you need the target and the biology to drive forward the therapeutics. So call your congressperson, it's really important. Yes, who's next? Um, why is it that uh, drugs that are sold in the United States by let's say Eli Lilly or Pfizer or Sanofi or, or one of those companies sold in the United States are much more expensive than those same drugs manufactured and distributed by those same companies I just mentioned are so much less expensive in Canada. And the fact is that we see busloads of people coming from the United States to fill their prescriptions when basically they're the same same uh, uh, prescription <coughs> drugs that we're buying in both countries, they cost the same to manufacture, whether they're, they happen to be manufactured in Canada or manufactured in the U.S. and distributed by those companies and many others. So why is there, uh, 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 so therefore it's got to be less profitable for a Pfizer and Eli Lilly or, yeah. or whoever uh, so in selling drugs in Canada. Yeah. Let me let let us assume, and we could debate this, that the companies, the drug companies, are working on a, a very straightforward arithmetic profit loss model. Um, there are we could debate whether any CEO should make a thousand times what a manager makes in any company, whether it's a car company or a drug company, and we could debate the inequities in society and, and corporate world. Let's set that aside. I think that's a, a separate discussion. I per have personal feelings about that, but it's a separate discussion. Let us assume it's a zero-sum game. The reality is that there are 4,000 trials and 40 approvals. It's a hugely risky business. And so every failed, every successful drug approval and the revenue from it has to pay for all those failures. And beyond that, it's a zero-sum around the world. And so the total global revenues have to pay for the total global failures. And the United States subsidizes the rest of the world. We pay more for drugs here so that there can be those drugs. But without those drugs, without that money, there would be fewer trials, there would be fewer approvals. So we could decide to make it a flat system where we pay what uh, Mexico pays, then we'd have 10 approvals instead of 46. To for that would be the price of it. There'd be less. Remember, prosperity and excess money is what funds it. Now, you could say, well, I don't have excess money. I don't want to pay four times what Mexico is paying. If as a society we say that, then we'll have a fourth of the drugs, and that's the reality. It's a, it's a hard decision, and especially when it becomes a personal choice, but that's, that's at least the arithmetic as I see it. I think I'm getting the waving hand from Ben to knock it off. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Well, you ready to go home? 
So did anybody announce when the next conference is? What was the date? 2020. And the date was June what? Nobody has it? Minneapolis. We'll get you the date because what, Michelle? It's in my binder. Well, what do you know? Ah, June 20th to 22nd in Minneapolis. All right. That was June 20th to 22nd in Minneapolis. What? Uh, 2020. Every two years. June 20th, 2020. Anyway, I hope you all had a great time this weekend. You know, you guys, you, you all, I hope you, you understand and you could feel how, how important you are to us. You know, you're a big part. You are the FFB family, and it's important for us to make sure that we uh, provide great service for you, and I hope you, uh, you felt that uh, over the last few days. And uh, I hope many of you are staying for the activities tonight and tomorrow. Uh, I know there's a bunch of trips planned, and we've tried to make it a little family-oriented, so please enjoy that. Um, you heard many, many things. I'm not going to waste a lot of your time because you probably all heard out. But Luxerna is the first of many uh, clinical uh, successes. Hopefully, two years from now, we'll be able to uh, report on a couple more and then a couple more and a couple more. And so um, I hope that you uh, enjoyed everything uh, on your way out. Uh, see if you want any raffle prizes. And um, again, I thank the staff and Michelle, and Ben, and Jason, and everybody else. And we'll see you in Minneapolis. Take care.